You all are in for a treat. You all have been asking for more science about addiction, and who better to get than one of the leading scientists when it comes to addictions of all types. So check it out. I just finished an interview with Dr. Judson Brewer, and let me know what you think in the comments. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is Chris from TheRewiredSoul.com, and I am here with Dr. Judson Brewer. And basically, just to kind of let you know how I was introduced to him, um, I was listening to the 10% Happier podcast with uh, Dan Harris, and um, Judd was talking a lot about just addiction and craving, and the way he was describing it, it really felt like he knew what I was going through, even though he's not an addict himself. You're not an addict, correct? I have many addictions. Yeah. But, uh... <laughs> but, yeah, and that's, and that's kind of what, what drew me towards you. And, and then realizing that you were doing a lot of studies on this stuff and hooking people up to brain scanners and all that kind of good stuff. So um, I really got intrigued. I heard that he had a book coming out called The Craving Mind. So I kept an eye out for that. And that's what um, we're going to be talking a lot about today. So if you haven't read it yet, I highly, highly, highly recommend you go check it out. Um, but yeah, so Judd, uh, what got you into addiction psychiatry? Like you talked about how you had a previous major and then you kind of switched focuses. Yeah, I was, my PhD was officially in immunology and I was studying molecular mechanisms of why we get sick when we get stressed out. So I'd always had this interest in, in that type of thing. Uh, but on the side, at least at the time, on the side, I was I was learning meditation myself and had a regular practice and was going on retreat. Um, and by the time I finished my MD PhD program, I had been practicing about eight years. And when I started residency training in psychiatry, I started noticing that my patients were actually talking in the same type of language that I had been learning in my meditation practices in the Buddhist terminology where they were using words like craving and clinging and wanting. And it really didn't, it seemed like it was too much of a coincidence to, to think that these things were not linked. And of course, uh, all of that, I, that I'd learned was that, you know, a lot of suffering was causing, was caused by craving. And here I was seeing it uh, play out in real life uh, with my patients with addiction. So th really that was one place where, you know, I really not only started to see this language lineup, but there was something I'd grown up uh, poor in Indiana, and there was something where I could really, I could really relate to the underdog and people with addictions. They are the ultimate underdogs. Not only getting the beat down by society, but often just beating themselves down so much just because there's, you know, it seems like often there's so much stacked against them. So. There was something that I could just really relate to uh, from many level on many levels. Awesome, and and yeah, I'm I'm glad you kind of talked about that too. Just how those two line up, and so in your book, in the Craving Mind, uh, I think it was when you were talking about starting your um, your smoking program, and mm -hmm. you were talking about the half life of nicotine being about two hours. So to experience what. Your, these people were going through, you started to sit for two hours. And, like, that's crazy. Like, did, did that help you connect with what they were going through a little bit more, do you think? <laughs> it was pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I Yeah, I hadn't smoked. You know, I, I was an, uh, an athlete, and that was actually one of my addictions when was running. <laughs> uh, so I hadn't really been a hardcore smoker and really wanted to be able to relate very directly to my patients and you know I was telling them to see if they could ride out a craving and typically the cravings come on after about two hours because that's when the nicotine levels are low so I said okay I'm gonna sit without moving for two hours and and take it <laughs> and man my brain beat the crap out of me <laughs> yeah so uh, and it's funny. It wasn't the physical pain actually that was that was the worst part. It was the restlessness. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. So did did the people you were working with? Did they know that you were putting yourself through this to relate to them a little bit better? No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't really talk about that very much. And uh, uh, but I did say, you know, because I get this question: Have you ever smoked? You know, 
because you're this, you know, this um, privileged white guy, and, and it's absolutely true. I, I was and am a privileged white guy, um, but I said, I said, look, I have plenty of addictions, and if if you don't believe me by the end of the evening, this was in our first class, then call me out on it because you know I I'm I shouldn't be working with you if I if I can't relate to what you're going through. Mm-hmm. Nobody ever called me out. Yeah. It's it's. Craving is a craving is a craving. Yeah, and I think that's that's what's really cool too because um, I I work at a rehab and uh, you know a lot of the clients you know they connect with me because I am an addict in recovery and that's one of the reasons I connected with you because even though you don't have a you know drug or alcohol addiction the way you were talking I was like but he understands what all these things are and um, you know maybe it's just mindfulness allowing you to hone in on what's actually happening you know. Uh, so that's another reason why people should go out and check out this book because you clearly know what you're talking about. But one thing that I, I wanted to ask, you brought up, you know, addicts being that underdog, right? And they're beat down by society as well as them beating themselves up. So one of the things you mentioned in your book when talking about smokers is that, you know, they have this addiction and it's no different than any other one. But obviously there's less, there's a there's still a stigma about smoking, obviously, because of all the health issues and all that. But a topic that's been coming up a lot lately is that stigma around addiction. Why do you feel that is? It's a great question. I don't have a great answer to it. But I I would say a couple of possibilities are one, you know, there's something that's actually rewarding about distancing ourselves from others. So, you know, when we look down on others, it's a way to prop ourselves up. So that might be one societal reason. Uh, There may even be a deep fear um, of people, you know, one, you know, like, oh no, that, you know, there's an addict and that's not me as in they're projecting or they're worried about, you know, that having their own tendencies. Um, and, and also there can just be this level of not being able to relate to another human being. I think there are a lot of, you know, and, and maybe all or none of those are true, but I think there are a number of, it, one, we do see it really commonly, and two, I think it could be different, you know, different for different people um, based on their own history, you know. Yeah. And so one one thing that I love about the book is you talk about all sorts of addictions. You talk mm-hmm. about addiction to thinking, addiction to obviously technology. Do you think that the way it's described in your book, like that it's bringing more people to kind of find that common ground, like we kind of all have our own little addictions? That's what I was hoping with the book is that people can really see that it, this is human behavior. And it's, you know, there's this stigma and there's this self-flagellation around addiction. But the truth is, this is just how our brains work. And, you know, it, it gets a little out of control for some of us. Yeah. Uh, and if we really look at it, it, it's actually more out of control for more of us than than many of us think, especially around technology. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think... That was the aim is, you know, it's everything from phones to distraction to romantic love. It's the same pathway. And the, the beautiful thing there is that, one, we can start to see the common humanity and, and stop judging others and stop beating each other up or trying to beat someone down so I can, you know, I can feel better about myself. We can start connecting more with others. We can start understanding where somebody's coming from more because we can put their, ourselves in their shoes. And importantly, if we understand our minds, we can work. We can start to work with our minds and even tap into that same process to overcome these addictions themselves. That's that's where what really inspired me to write the book. Yeah, that's awesome. And one of my favorite parts of the book is your whole story about Lance Armstrong and the subjective bias. So, like one of the one of the reasons why I've really just been so trying to get this whole mindfulness thing and keep working at it is that whole self-awareness and when we talk Mm -hmm. about that subjective bias it seems like that's kind of that lack of self-awareness um yeah so why do you so and maybe it's helpful just to kind of frame what subjective bias is in case folks haven't read the book yet so i think of um reward-based learning as you know we learn based on different behaviors so if we um, learn to, you know, if we get stressed out and we learn to smoke a cigarette or eat a cupcake when we're stressed, the reward that that temporary feeling of, of relief or whatever then feeds back to our brain 
and says, oh, next time you're stressed out, you should smoke a cigarette. And so that's what I think of and what the literature talks about in terms of subjective bias. So we're subjectively biased toward smoking cigarettes or eating cupcakes in the future. And I think of it as, you know, we put on glasses and we start to see the world through, if I'm stressed, I should eat cupcakes glasses, right? So that's the subjective bias where we're not seeing clearly. Um, so go ahead. So that's just a little yeah, bit of frame. No, thank you for doing that. Cause yeah, a lot of people are probably wondering what the heck that means. Um, and how, and how does that lead to suffering? Um, like when you talk about your Lance Armstrong thing, like I can look at my own experience and for those of you who haven't read the book yet, Judd was defending Lance Armstrong's doping allegations, like nobody's business, but like, I, I, I look at that as often like arguments that happen just between people because they have such a strong subjective bias. Like, do you think it's it's difficult for people to kind of look inward and take off those glasses? If we don't know that we're wearing them, <laughs> that's the most difficult part. If we if we walk through life always thinking, oh yeah, Lance Armstrong is the greatest guy. Uh, we're never going to take the glasses off. So I think if we don't know that we're wearing them, that's the biggest piece. And then that insight helps us start to work through things. And, you know, I, I certainly defended Lance. I think I, I like to think of it as I was addicted to Lance, you know, like yeah. I, I loved every aspect of that guy. And, you know, in the, the one tour de France where he, you know, somebody wrecked and he like rode through this field and like topped back up and made, you know, just hopped right back into the peloton like that guy could do no wrong. And so that was my subjective bias. I was like, this guy, you know, he's a cancer survivor. He's a, he toughs it out. You know, he can do it. If, if anybody can do it, this guy can do it. And so when the, the doping allegations came on, I didn't know I was wearing Lance glasses, you know, uh, the, my, I love Lance glasses. And so, you know, people are like, Oh, maybe he did dope. And I was like, are you kidding? No, that guy's Superman. Yeah. You, you just can't handle that. He's good. And, and actually it was that I couldn't handle <laughs> the possibility uh, that that he had actually d gone way out of his way to you know dope for the entirety of his you know Tour de France career, from what I understand. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting just listening to you talk about that. And you know, I'm a recovering opioid addict, and it's like these I love drugs glasses, you know, mm -hmm. and that's something that obviously addicts get sucked into because they know it's bad, but all these justifications and rationalizations like, oh, no, it'll help. Um, but, uh, <laughs> this time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so one thing, one thing that I've always found interesting, too, I don't know if you talked about it in the book as in-depth as you did when you were speaking with Dan Harris, but you talked about how when you first started meditating, you were just, it was, like, difficult because you were sweating profusely and you said that went on for oh, like years and so my question to you is since I'm always trying to get people to start meditating or practicing mindfulness in general and they'll try it maybe once or twice and they're like eh that doesn't work but you mm -hmm. went like what kept you going like how what made you not just throw in the towel and say this is not doing anything I'm done <laughs> I have a thick skull <laughs> <laughs> I I um I like challenges, and I'm I'm very determined. I think mm -hmm. so. It was like, okay, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Uh, and what <laughs> I what I look back on now is like every time I was like, I'm going to do this. I was actually moving in the opposite direction. So <laughs> that's where I was, you know, like sweating through t-shirts, working so hard to meditate correctly. And now I look back at that, and I was like, oh, <laughs> that was so the opposite of what this is about. Yeah. Uh, maybe I needed to do it at the time to understand that, but hopefully other people can learn from my, <laughs> my sweating mistakes and, yeah. you know, and, and can learn it a little you know, more clearly. Cause I, for me, it wasn't clear, you know, it's just like, okay, I can force things. Well, I'm going to force my awareness onto my breath. And the, and the truth is that awareness doesn't take any force. Just like, you know, if somebody's listening to the sound of my voice, it doesn't take any effort to hear me. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's there's a real simplicity to these practices that can be really challenging to actually tap into when when our thinking minds come online and say, oh, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any is there any kind of advice you give? Because I'm sure you run into people you work with um, who want to give up, or they say, my mind. The most common one I hear is, 
my mind won't stop. This doesn't work. My mind yeah. won't stop. Is there anything yeah. that you tell them, like, just to keep pushing forward? <laughs> Why are you trying to stop your mind? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's number one. It's like, okay, somebody gave you some instructions that were probably not helpful. Uh, trying to stop our minds, that's not the point. Uh, the point is learning how our minds work and understanding how our minds work and changing our relationship to our minds. So it's really about noticing what it feels like to get caught up, right? To get caught up in thinking, to got, get caught up in a craving, to get caught up in, you know, anger. And that caught upness is where the suffering comes, right? Mm -hmm. So the advice I would give people is stop trying to meditate, uh, this isn't about trying to do anything and simply pay attention as you go through out your day and see, you know, this is about reward based learning. This is about cause and effect. So if we can see the results of our behaviors clearly, if we just keep an eye out for that, right. And sitting, doing sitting meditation can help us see that more clearly, but that's not, you know, that's not the end all be all. We can do this at any moment. Oh, you know, if I yell at somebody and I see that that causes suffering for them, I've just learned something, mm -hmm. right? So my subjective, I should yell at people, glasses, I take them off for a moment. There's, there's real insight. So it's not about sitting down and forcing our minds to be still or stopping our thoughts or doing any of this stuff. It's about seeing cause and effect clearly. Oh, I yelled at somebody. Oh, I suffered and they suffered. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, and... It, that's what this is about. It's like, oh, when I smoke a cigarette and it tastes crappy, oh, I'm less excited to smoke a cigarette again. There's real behavior change. That's what mindfulness is about, is changing our behaviors, moving away from suffering. But we can't force ourselves to move away, move away from suffering. All we can do is see what we get when we do a certain behavior. So I would start by saying, you know, encouraging people to ask this simple question, what do I get from this? When I do a certain behavior, mm -hmm. what do I get? There's the exploration. It doesn't take some sitting in a lotus posture, you know, with our eyes closed and a big grin on our face that's probably fake. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Cool. Uh, the last thing I kind of want to talk about, too. So after I was completely sold on Judd, I found out that he had a couple apps. Um, one of them, as some of you can see, I'm a little hefty. And one of them is called Eat Right Now. And it was using mindfulness to lose weight. And I like to use myself as a guinea pig. And I started using the program. And I know the goal, you know, at first isn't to lose weight. It's just to kind of be aware of what we're eating and all that kind of stuff. But just to let you know, I ended up losing 30 pounds by doing this. And thank you, thank you. And, you know, a lot of it was, too, it was, I, I part of what I learned was, to stop looking at the scale and just notice how good my body felt when I quit shoving junk down my throat, you know? And, um, and what also helped a lot too is every week they have, you know, a group chat with everybody who's using the program. That was really beneficial too, to kind of see the struggles and everything. Now I am using his other program called Craving to Quit, which is to quit smoking. And I have made a deal with Judd that today is the last day I'm smoking. So all of you out there can keep me accountable. Um, but what I wanted to ask, Doug, so basically, with your program, it seems like pretty much any habit can start to get broken with this program. Like, what do you have anything in store in the future as far as these apps go? Well, I have to say, I've been pretty happy with the way that these programs have going were, have been going. We have we weren't expecting that these would work so well. <laughs> And I have to say, it's really gratifying uh, to be able to work with folks, you know, not only with developing the app, but we have this Eat Right Now community where every week we get to go online and talk to folks and, and see how they're doing. And also we have this online community where people can really support each other and, and I get to follow folks. So it's really, it's really gratifying to, to get to do this work and, and help people. And I have to say, on you know, even scientifically, we're seeing uh, a 40% reduction in craving-related eating uh, with the Eat Right Now program. So that was a, a study that one of my uh, collaborators at UCSF, um, her name is Ashley Mason, did. And so, you know, we're, we're seeing some really remarkable changes. And uh, so with that, we've been 
actually pilot testing uh, an anxiety program. So tell me what you think of this. The uh, title is probably going to be Unwinding Anxiety. What do you think of that as a name for that program? So I like it because as someone who's dealt with anxiety, I feel wound up. But uh, well, see, with, uh, with our following here, we can ask people to leave in the comments section what they think of Unwinding Anxiety. And we can get some more great. feedback. Um, Great. So we've been pilot testing that for a while now, and we hope to have a good solid beta version out for people to play with um, by the fall of this year. Cool. Is there? Is it going to be kind of open to whoever wants to try it, or is there anywhere people can go to check uh, check in and maybe be part of the testing? Or? The website is going to be called unwindinganxiety.com. dot okay. com, uh, and. Th they can also go to my website. I think it's just judsonbrewer.com and sign up. You know, and say, "Hey, you know, I want to be a. I want, I want to learn more about your um, anxiety program because actually, anxiety has a lot to do with uh, drug addiction. Yes. <laughs> At least a lot of my patients. Um, one of the big relapse, uh, you know, causes and one of the things that they constantly struggle with is anxiety. And they're, you know, for a lot of people, the medications that are out there are uh, suboptimal. Let's say, you know, I'm. Uh, uh, for, for some people, some of these work pretty well, but you know, especially if I'm an addiction psychiatrist, I can't prescribe benzos for most mm -hmm. of my patients because of the addiction potential. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really wanted to develop something that could help them learn the skills where they they could develop their own inner pill rather than d relying on something outside of themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So, do you think? In the future, there might be one that's just for drug and alcohol addiction that can be as simple as in their cell phone? That's really what we're hoping to do. We need to get a little bit more funding uh, to do that. Uh, it's amazing um, how it's hard to get NIH funding to develop these programs. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we rely on philanthropic support um, for people to help us out with those things. And so, honestly, I'm I'm just waiting to um, to develop that a bit, but I've been pilot testing it in my clinic um, for the last year. Um, and I, you and I have had a number of conversations mm -hmm. around um, really how that program will be set up as well. But th the hope is that as soon as possible, we'll have one for general addictions as well. Yeah. So anybody out there watching, if you happen to be a millionaire or you want to donate to this, <laughs> let me know. Um, but again, Judd, thank you so much for your time, and I hope to have you back uh, at another point when uh, the new apps get launched and all that. So thank you very much, and just let you all know, I will be putting links in the description below to Judd's book, to the apps, to his website, and all that stuff. So thanks again, Judd. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. As I mentioned, check the description below for links to all of Judd's work as well as his book. Please, please, please do not forget to like this video, subscribe, and if you have anything that you want me to go over in the future, feel free to leave it in the comments. I'll see you next time.